Um, in case you don't know who I am, I'm Professor Isis Fernandez. I'm an English professor. Yes, girl. Better let them know. Better let them know. <laughs> and I'm going to talk to you about one of the books that you don't know you love yet, Chronicle of a Death Foretold. Let me tell you about this book when I first read it. I read it in grad school. I went to a little grad school called Goddard College, little tiny little thing. Um, and my advisors, they don't call them professors up there, they call them advisors. Um, they advise nothing, by the way. <laughs> they just tell you what to do. There's no advice, there's like, okay, you're a G1, these are the books you should read. Pick 15 and that's what you're doing. Um, and so I picked, I picked Chronicle of a Death Foretold because you know, I didn't want to read 100 Years of Solitude because it's long, the perpetual student. Um, and I read it and I'm just like, what is this? Who is this? What's going on? And I fell in love with Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who is, I learned very late in my writing, very early in my writing career, late in my academic career, that he was somebody that everyone should know. A giant of Latin American literature. He told stories, told because he has passed, told stories like my dad told stories. He told stories that were magical and realistic and fantastical and made the ordinary extraordinary. So this is why you should read this book. So I'm gonna start with this question. If you knew something was about to happen but you were not a fan of the person or didn't know them and it was about to happen too, would you say something? If it was like your enemy and they were about to be in a traffic accident because they didn't have enough air in their tires or whatever, would you say something? You would? You're a good egg. Why would you? Why would you? <laughs> if they're going to go out, it's not on my conscience. OK, let, let the universe deal with as it may. All right, so I'm, I'm hearing if it's going to result in a physical type of thing, like they were going to be hurt physically, you would say something. This is a central question of this novel, right? There's a lot. Of, let me just say, this novel has so many central questions so many themes. As an English teacher, I'm like, where do I start? Oh my God, there's so much. But at what point do you act when a tragedy is nearing to a person you may think deserves it? You are an awful person. I hope you fall down these stairs because your shoe is untied. You need to be taken down a peg, right? Some people will think that. Yes, okay. So let's talk about Chronicle of a Death Foretold. Love this book, love it so much. Awesome. Okay, so it's a novella, not a novel, <laughs> which makes it short. Yes, because I did look at 100 Years of Solitude when I was in grad school, and I'm like, I'm not reading that. Because you got to read a novel a, week, a novel a week, and I'm not reading that in a week. That's just not happening. Um, so I read this, and this was great. Spoiler alert, somebody dies. Read the title, guys. Somebody dies. Um, it's a mystery. At its heart, this is about a mystery. Not a, not a typical mystery of like, who done it or who's going to die, because you're told that at the beginning. That first page, you know everything. You know who's going to die. You know who did it. You kind of know why, but you don't quite know the how and all the specific things, right? So it's a mystery, but it's a mystery also on another level, as in... What would I do if I was in that spot? What would I do if it was me? If I was Santiago and people didn't like me because I'm kind of awesome and I have some money and I kind of treat women not that great, but some women I treat really well. What do I do, right? Um, it tells of an honor killing, but, but um, is it all about the honor or just did people like not like him? <laughs> It is an honor killing. There is an honor killing here. Um, I'm trying not to spoil the book because I want you to read the book. So I'm, trying to, I'm giving you a synopsis without giving you a synopsis. I hope I'm doing well. Um, but you know, there, there is a, Santiago does get killed and it's an honor killing because somebody said something that may or may not be true. And it's up to you as a reader to fig, figure out who you're gonna trust, right? Who are you going to believe? And that's actually at the center of some of the things that are happening right now and have happened in the past couple of years. Who are you going to believe? 
the Me Too movement comes up, right? We have Weinstein, we have Bill Cosby. I believe the women because, whoo, child, that is not an isolated incident. But when we have stories of people doing other things to other people that they shouldn't do, and it's one against the other, then the idea of character, who they are before the incident, who they are since the incident, their motives come into play. And that's how we decide. That's our like moral, ethical compass. And this puts it front and center. This story puts it front and center. Some themes, old versus new, justice versus social justice. Do you take justice in your own hands? Or you just let the world do what it may? Do you tell the person that you hate, probably since the fourth grade, that their shoe is untied and they're, about to, and they're running to class and they're about to go down the steps? Do you tell them their shoe is untied or do you just let the universe provide? I don't know, up to you. And of course, magical realism, which is awesome, is uh, all through this book. I have one example in this slide, but there are many examples. I can talk about magical realism for literally like an hour, I've done it before. Um, um, I love it, it's great. Okay, so this gentleman here is the person who wrote Chronicle of a Death Foretold. He also wrote 100 Years of Solitude. He also wrote Love in the Time of Cholera. He wrote 100 Years of Solitude, uh, Chronicle of a Death Foretold, Love in the Time of Cholera, um, lots and lots of short novellas, lots and lots of short stories. I urge you, to pick up a collection of his short stories, like from when he first started, because what he first started was not who he is now. I feel like he needed a hug at the beginning of his writing career. Like he was super emo boy, like super, like I read like uh, the one about the blue dog and I'm just like, who didn't tell you they loved you today? Like who didn't hug you because ooh, homie, mm -mm. Um, but uh, that is who he is, um, and he's pretty dope. So let's learn about him. He was born in Arracataca, Colombia. I love saying that word. It's fun. You should say it. Let's say it. Arracataca. Isn't it fun? It's like it just, and if you can roll your R's, it's even funner. It's even more fun, not funner. I am not legally blonde. Okay. Um, Arracataca, Colombia, 1927, that means he was old. He's older than my dad was. My dad was born in the 30s. He has since passed. Um, umbilical cord around his neck. He was born with one around his neck, and so was I, so I feel a kinship with him. Um, our birthdays are like a month away from each other, and um, we both learned storytelling at the, at the knee of, of an older man. Me, I learned at my father's knee. Him, he learned um, by his grandmother and his grandfather, his maternal grandfather. So I feel a connection, even though I'm half Cuban and nowhere near Colombia. Um, but I feel a kinship. Um, so I'm looking, I see a couple of my students. So I'm gonna put y'all on the spot. 1302. When I, yeah. Yeah, bring it out. When I say this writer is having a conversation with something or someone, what do I mean? Do me proud. Yolanda? Yes, ma'am. What'd you got? Say it. Now put me all on the spot now. Who is he speaking to? Yes. Who is he? Hey, look at that, I did something good, hey. Um, who is he having a conversation with? Who is he speaking to? What are they having a connection with? Um, he, I'm gonna tell you right now, everything, a lot of things. But I, I broke it down with who he was influenced by in Latin America, who he was in, influenced by in America or English language writing. Um, and you would be surprised. Jorge Luis Borges and Juan Rulfo, if anybody who's into Latin American literature know that these also are our big, giant greats of Latin American literature, especially Juan Rulfo. I have read Pedro Paramo, which is his big book. 
Um, by big book, I mean another novella, because again, grad school, wasn't gonna do that. It is crazy good. <laughs> like, if you want like a little bit of horror and a little bit of like, a lot of magical realism and a lot of like, um, I have to do something for um, a loved one and I'm going through this journey, Pedro Panamo is really good. It's very similar to Faulkner's As I Lay Dying, of which he's, he considered, Gabo considered uh, Faulkner and Hemingway his teachers. So if you're a writer, one of the things that you learn about is that what you read isn't just what you read. What you read is what is teaching you, and you call them your teachers, right? So for instance, Gal Gabo is my teacher. He is my maestro. And for him, it was Faulkner, uh, Kafka, and Hemingway. Kafka, he wrote that book about that big roach, and that guy turned into a roach, you remember that? Yeah. The Metamorphosis. And he was also known as Gabo to his friends. So you will hear him, you will hear me call him Garcia Marquez or Gabo. Because we were like this. Okay. So um, let me tell you a little known fact about him and another thing that kind of ties me to him. He was a former journalist, as am I. <laughs> um, we both got out of the game real quick though. So let me let's just put that out there. Um, he went to school to be a lawyer. He was given money to go to to be a lawyer. And then he was all like, you know, this is not the life for me. And so he started writing for a newspaper in Barranquilla, I believe. No, Cartagena, El Universal. And then he went to Barranquilla and then the capital of Colombia um, to write. So he had a pretty decent, long journalistic career. And he talks about, when he talks about his journalistic career, he says he can't be the writer he is or was without that career. Not just because you know, he was writing every day, um, but because he was able to find stories and able to understand the heartbeat of a story and what makes something wondrous. So with the idea of his grandfather and grandmother telling him stories that are magical and fantastical, how one tells stories in Latin America, let me tell you, storytelling in Latin America, if you ever get somebody's abuelita from like Latin America to tell you a story, hear it, have somebody translate it because it's awesome. Hey, oh my God, everything is just heightened. Like a story about going to the store takes about two hours because it's like, well, first I got up and then I saw the sun and the sun was telling me it was gonna rain, but nobody believed me. So I went ahead and took my umbrella, but esta singer right here, she was caught in the set in a downpour and she didn't listen to me. Now look at her, she has giddy and she's about to die. She hasn't even gotten out of the house yet. That's why it's two hours, <laughs> all right? Um, so yeah, so my books are books of journalists. That is a direct quote from Gabo. When we talk about that and his, and his books being books of journalists, um, that's the approach. This is how that book was written from the perspective of a journalist. Even from the first line, the first line looks like, as a, as a former journalist, a lead. When you read an actual like article, Back then, there used to be these things called newspapers that you would read. Yeah. Um, they're now online. They're like articles now. Right? So you go to the New York Times or the Houston Chronicle, and that first line is usually its own paragraph. That's called a lead. And that first line reads like a lead to me. Okay? So let's talk about um, Garcia Marquez and his, I hope this is the right video. It doesn't, doesn't look like, no, it is. Yes. Um, Let's talk about um, Garcia Marquez. This is from Democracy Now. When he died, um, when he died, I literally mourned. Like I, 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 like I mourned somebody in my family. Um, when he died, they did a really good special. The first five minutes are very telling. It tells you a lot of things. It also answers some questions that are on your worksheet. Um, just FYI. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this if I can. Okay, let's talk about that a little bit. This, uh, this, um, I didn't say speech, it was called Solitude in Latin America. Soledad in Latin America. Um, and it was when I first heard it, I'm just like, ooh, social issues, my homie. 
Yeah, he really talked about kind of like why magical realism exists in Latin America and that it actually is a coping mechanism for what was going on in Latin America. And of course, if you've seen Narcos, you probably know a little bit. Not a lot though, you know what Netflix tells you. Um, <laughs> um, but we, you know, especially Colombia, who um, at the time, the 90s was the, the worst, but uh, at the time became kind of the epicenter for drugs and cocaine and, and all that. Um, and so he talked about, this is, you know, Latin America has gotten a raw deal for a while and how we actually cope is through storytelling. And our storytelling has to be magical and realistic at the same time in order for us to survive. Um, and I heard that, when I heard that, I thought about my dad, who was older. Um, I heard, thought about my, my grandma in Guatemala. I heard about, I thought about all the older members of my family and how they tell stories. And I'm like, oh, because y'all went through some stuff too. There's a whole like civil war in Guatemala and the whole nine, like people died and stuff. And like I'm just like, yeah, I can see that I can see why it takes you two hours to tell a story about going to the grocery store. Because in those two hours, you go through all your emotions and you go through all your life or part of your life, and at the end, there's some sort of resolution. There's a breathing out, a catharsis. Remember that word from 1302? Hey. Well, y'all didn't have catharsis because we didn't there, but catharsis, catharsis is happening. Okay, great thing. All right, let's keep going. You guys have any questions so far? We're, I promise you we're going to get to the book, like right now. Okay, so let's look at the first line of uh, Chronicle of a Death Foretold. On the day they were going to kill him, Santiago Nazar got up at 5.30 in the morning to wait for the boat the bishop was coming in. Does it sound journalistic? Absolutely. This is a, also an interesting book because the other mystery that's in this book is who the heck is the narrator here? Literally, because the narrator's never named. You know that he is related. You know it's a he. I thought it was a she for, a, for the longest time until I got to a point in the book where I'm just like, oh, you're the brother of this person. Okay. He. Um, and, um, he is telling, the narrator is telling the story from like tw uh, 27 years, it's a couple decades, 27 years after the incident. So he wasn't even there. He wasn't even there, so he has to be journalistic, right? And it's a really great opening story, or opening line. If you look at, if you Google, not right now because I'm talking, but after I'm done talking, um, you should Google the first line of 100 Years of Solitude. It is one of the most well-known first lines in literature. Wonderfully done. Also, another thing about him um, that I'm gonna remember right now, Leaf Storm was his first like big novella, and he was writing, and he, this is the love of a good woman right here. He was writing, he didn't thought it was, a, he didn't think it was a good, a good, a good uh, thing, and he's just like, ah, oh, I'm gonna tear it up and throw it away. And she steals it and sends it to a publisher, and they publish it, and he starts his career. So all this thing, like, I was a journalist, and then I did this. No, nah, homie, your wife sent in your manuscript. <laughs> and that's how you got this gig, OK? All right, and so there you go, just an aside. All right, usually I go for Marvel characters. Today I decided we'll go for DC. Those who have me know that like I design with Marvel all the time. But today, let's just you know do Superman and Wonder Man and what, whatnot. Okay, cast of characters. Santiago Nassad, he is our central character. He dies, sorry, spoiler alert. Um, and um, we don't know if he's a good guy or a bad guy. Um, the first part, the first chapter, or the first section, there's like four or five sections in this, in this novella. Um, he is painted out to be like the worst dude ever. He's like, touching people inappropriately. He's making comments he shouldn't be making to the, to the poor house girl in the house. People hate him because, well, they're, you know, on the slick was racist, they were racist because he was, he wasn't, his family wasn't originally from Colombia. They were from the Middle East. I'm trying to remember the book. Um, from the Middle East somewhere. And so he was an outsider and he always was an outsider. He's also rich. 
outsider, rich, and inappropriate with women. Wasn't the best guy. But when you get to the second part, to the second chapter, he's the best guy ever. Oh my God, you're gonna marry this sweet girl? Oh my God, you, like you do this and you, you help out this way? You're awesome. So then who do you believe? Aha, see, those central questions that come back and haunt you? It's what English teachers do, that's why we're awesome. Um, then I'm gonna uh, skip over to the colonel right quick. I'm gonna go to the Bayardo San Roman, him and Angelica Vicarro. Um, this all started with them. I blame them. Um, they're getting married, and at first Angelica was all like, I don't wanna marry this dude. Bayardo, I wanna put an N in his name, but I, I keep looking and like, no, there's no N. Bayardo um, was actually an outsider. He came into the small town. Um, also rich, parallels much, also rich, but he was more beloved because he spread, he spread his money around, so people loved him. And the millisecond he saw Angelica, he's all like, that's the woman I'm gonna marry. And he pursued her relentlessly. I'm gonna let that linger a little bit. It is what she needs, it is what I'm saying. Um, pursued her relentlessly. At first she was all like, nope. And her family's all like, he's rich? What you, what's wrong with you? You will have a want for nothing. And she's all like, but I don't like him. And they're like, we don't care, marry him. So she ends up marrying him. And then hilarity ensues. I'm not gonna tell you about that because read the book. Um, Pablo and Pedro are there, is, uh, is her, are their brothers? Ugh. They are her brothers. Hello, English teacher. Um, and they're twins. And then we have, of course, the narrator, who we don't know who they are. The colonel, fun times, um, was the person that could have stopped everything. <laughs> I did not, because he was distracted. Oh, fun stuff. OK, let's look at the setting. Small town near the water. Um, sounds like another story that we read, yeah? Doesn't it? Yeah, Gabo has a pattern. Um, they're celebrating the, um, the wedding of Bayaro and Angelica, and it was like a three-day thing. It was a three-day nonstop party where people were doing all kinds of things they probably shouldn't have been doing. Um, and it actually parallels with the visit of the bishop. Now, I, I put visit in um, quotations because um, this is a Catholic town. And if you're in a Catholic town, ain't nothing bigger than like getting a visit from somebody higher up. Oh my God, like you stop the world for it. Um, and so he becomes a symbol in this book. Read the book, figure out the symbol. I'm not telling you all the answers, come on now. But um, he never gets off the boat. They, everybody brings all the offerings to the bishop, to the shoreline, chickens are involved. Um, lots of food, lots of things, things in cages. And um, he picks, he goes, does the little wave, grabs all the stuff, and he's out. Doesn't even get off the boat. Um, again, this story is told decades late after the incidents, after everything has happened. So everything is about interviews and documents. Again, written in a journalistic style. So there's a little bit of detachment here. Yes? I don't know about the time of when it was, where the story takes place. It just takes place. Um, so I would be, I was, yes, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yes, it'll like, it started in 1910 and then in 27 years later, somebody wrote about it. It's in that same way, yeah. So let's talk about magical realism. A Hundred Years of Solitude was written in the style of magical realism. FYI, for those who's keeping track on a piece of paper. Okay, so magical realism is great because it takes something that's mundane and happens in life and takes that moment and heightens it. And it heightens it to an effect that it makes it otherworldly and it makes it special. It's the literature equivalent of a highlighter. Think of it that way, right? So 
Harry Potter, not magical realism. All the Lord of the Rings and its subsidiaries are not magical realism. If magic is involved, it's not magical realism. Please. And if they tell you wrong, tell them to come see me. All right? Oh, by the way, this is a picture of Makondo, I think, which is from uh, 100 Years of Solitude. He goes back to Makondo a couple of times, and it's actually, there's an allusion to Makondo in the book. Allusion, remember that term? Oh, look at that. It comes back to bite you, doesn't it? All right, so here's an example of magical realism. It's not the best example, but it's, it's the one that would fit <laughs> in the screen. My sister felt the angel pass by. She thought once more about the good fortune of Flora Miguel, who had so many things in life and was going to have Santiago Nasar as well on Christmas of that year. The idea of feeling the angel pass by is what heightens the idea of her thinking about her future son-in-law. Oh, good fortune is coming. I felt the angel pass by. Isn't it so simple, but yet so wonderful? Oh, I love magical realism. Moving on. OK, so who was Santiago Nasad? Was he a saint or was he a sinner? And you know, I think what's so interesting here is that there were so many opportunities to save his life. It was almost, it's almost a comedy of errors, really. So many opportunities to, to save his life from somebody putting something under the door to he probably shouldn't have left that day that early to homeboy who was playing dominoes and probably shouldn't just stop playing dominoes for a second. Um, so many opportunities to save his life. But what got in the way, not only situations, but people's idea of him. Was he worth saving? It's those questions I asked at the beginning. All right, so um, some of the big things that he's asking here, the conversations that Gabo are having, is having with this book. Are we jury and executioner? When do we get involved and should we get involved? Should we save Nassar? Santiago Nassar, should we save him? Is he worth saving? Who gets to decide that? You don't have to answer that question. But think about that. Who gets to decide who gets to be saved or not? Who gets to decide they're going to tell your worst enemy from fourth grade that their shoe is untied and they're running down the stairs? Is it you? Is it somebody else? Who gets to decide that? Do we believe people when they say things? Or do we let it? Ah, look at that grammar. Do we let it slide because we are having what we are hearing is beyond us? No, that can't happen. He's not like that. She's not like that. I don't believe you. Bring me the receipts. And so he's having conversations with this. I'm going to talk about Kitty Genovese. Did I say that correctly? I think I did. Um, because every time I read this book, I think about Kitty. So, 19. 1950, that's not, not up here. 1950 something, if I remember correctly. Sorry, my brain. Um, she was walking home um, in Queens, New York, and all her neighbors, 38 neighbors, heard her get murdered. And no one called the cops. No one came to help. She was stabbed. Now it's a whole syndrome. It's the Kitty Genovese syndrome. It's that thing, right? Well, somebody will do something. I don't have to do it, because obviously somebody needs to do something. I don't have that responsibility. I'm not going to tell my moral enemy, enemy, enemy from fourth grade that their shoe is untied and they're about to fall and bust their neck. Somebody will do that. I'm not responsible for that, right? So that's the big deal. He's having a conversation with that as well. So let's think about the people who were not believed before the tragedy happened. And I think about school shootings. And I think about before school shootings became school shootings. No, that guy is just quiet. Or no, they're just, you know, they're just having a bad day. Or it's, it's genuinely cold outside. You know, you explain away things because it's a little beyond us. It get, we can't quite understand or can't quite get that, that it's a bad thing that's happening. Or we have the feeling of it's not our responsibility. 
right? And that's what God was having a conversation with here. Whose responsibility it was it to make sure that these two brothers, i.e. idiots, who are drunk and felt like they had been dishonored, <laughs> not kill the person their sister said killed, did the thing. At what point do we sit down and say, okay, look homie, did you? Are you sure? Like, you can't be killing people all willy-nilly in these streets, right? We don't have that conversation. So things ensue. How now think about people who deserved what they got. Do you get to say they deserve what they got? Think about that. Sometimes we're just like, oh, you got what you deserve. You shouldn't have done that. But is it up to us to be jury and executioner? Do we get to decide that? Should it be that we decide that? Outside the realm of the legal system. I got it. Right? And what is our duty to each other? These are the questions he's playing with. Some of the themes that are there. What is that question that I sent? Themes, something along the lines. The conversations that he's having in this book. What is our duty to each other? What is our responsibility to each other as a community, as human beings on this planet? The big question in 1302 is, what can this story tell us about being human, right, on this planet? Remember that? What is the conversation this piece is having? And this is it. What is our duty to each other? This is the conversation it's having. So eventually he dies. <laughs> yes, Santiago dies, but Gabo dies. So we have to wrap it up with his death. Um, died in Mexico City. Hit the people who rushed to do um, eulogies about him, talk about him when he died, were contemporary liter literature's biggest, baddest, most awesomeness names. Isabel Allende, I have a story, but I'll come back to it in a minute. Um, Isabel Allende and Salman Rushdie, so glad he's still alive, because he was stabbed about a month or two ago. Um, to this day, Salman Rushdie talks about Gabal as a teacher for him, because Salman Rushdie also works in magical realism, even though I'm gonna argue it's a little bit different, but okay. Um, but he works in magical realism and he uses Gobble's work as a teacher. And all his works, papers, and manuscripts found a home at the Ransom Center at the University of Texas. Okay, I don't see a lot of people writing. I feel like you should be writing right now. Um, so, which is great because it's in Austin and I can go visit manuscripts. Um, I haven't physically visited the manuscripts, I've seen them online because they have a really Part of the collection online is really, really good. Um, and I just brought up Chronicle of a Death Foretold before coming here. Um, and I'm just like, ooh, this is great. His, his handwriting going through and just editing the book. And you're just like, oh my god, this is awesome. Um, so my story about Isabel Allende and Gabo, and I have to tell it because I'm very proud of it. So one of the things about being in Goddard is that you get two advisors reading your thesis which is a book-length thesis. Um, and it's in your last semester, and they read it twice. And the last read was from an advisor I was so glad I never had, because he was really hard on his students. Like, he made his students read Infinite Jest in a week, and I'm just like, I'm not about that life. Infinite Jest is a phone book. Like, it's, well, I'm exaggerating. Here, it's big. Um, and I'm not reading David Foster Wallace, I'm not gonna do that. And um, he read it and he said, this manuscript follows the Latin American, the Latin American tradition of magical realism from Isabel Allende and Garcia Marquez. He compared me to two of my literary heroes. And I'm like, oh! I die today, I die. And every time I get a chance to tell that story, I tell it. So now it's preserved on video. <laughs> so here's why you should love this book. Here's why. Boom. It forces the reader to ask questions about duty and responsibility. You got to sit with that ugliness, man. You got to sit with it. Makes commentary on small town life, religion, and archaic social norms. The sentence structure and the heightened language. And the story is told pretty interestingly. 
This bad boy is short, unlike my talk, so sorry. Um, told in the lit rich Latin American tradition, and you don't know the ending because I haven't told you, so you have to read it. <laughs> and with that, I'm done. Any questions? Yes? Was he Catholic or was he an atheist? Oh, good question. Oh, good question. I'm going to say when you're Catholic, you answer that two ways. Either you're a devout Catholic or you're a Catholic by custom. I'm going to say he was a Catholic by custom. I don't, I don't think he was going to Mass every day at 5 in the morning, but I think he's going to Mass on Christmas. Well, I mean, I, I haven't read the book yet, but I thought it was interesting listening to people that they really couldn't say whether the guy was good or bad, so, mm -hmm. you know, is, or the victim. And so I was wondering if part of this book is a, a meditation on just non-judgmentalism, uh, that, that human beings are a mixture of good and bad, you know, uh, I don't know. I think it's interesting. And that the bishop doesn't get off the right. boat because the church has no right to judge people if it's maybe right. making that symbolic statement. I was actually looking at the bishop as a symbol of kind of um, the blindness of the church. Like, we're that. Yeah. You know, we're going to take your money, but we're not going to do much of that. Right? So, oh, so many questions. One, okay, one, two, three. He was Arabic in heritage, and that's um, when you're populated by Spanish invaders. Mm -hmm. I'll editorialize. Um, the Arabs are the evil because they invaded Spain. And, and they've always been seen as evil. Yeah. 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 Even if, even if not Muslim. Mm -hmm. And there's many, many interesting comments that are made, even to this day. And I'm just like, homie, you're like on the slick racist. Please don't say that around me. But yeah, they still, yeah. Yes. So the whole story is told from like limited perspective. Right. So the, the story progression itself is revealed over time. It's like this, this painting that's coming together. Mm -hmm. and Why do you want to put me on the spot there? I don't know. Um, because I love let me think. Going to yeah, no, it's great. There are. Does not come to mind at the moment, but I know that there are. And I know that uh, there was one where I had read that they actually looked at Chronicle of a Death Foretold as kind of like their blueprint of how they would do it. Um, it's an interesting way of telling a story um, because with point of view, you can detach just enough to where you can ask these questions that I put, that I posed, right? Um, imagine if that was told in like first person from Santiago's perspective, or his mother's perspective, or his fiance's perspective, or ooh, Angelica's perspective. That would have been really great, yeah. right? That would have been great. I don't think he would have gotten the full story though, yeah. right? So um, that deliberate choice of point of view um, gives a little space for the reader. And especially the writer, but for the reader to just make their own decisions. And making it journalistic also adds to that tone. Yeah. Good question. Don't ever put me on the spot again, though. That was not pleasant. <laughs> yes. Uh, actually, two comments. One, I love your teaching style. Thank you. Uh, it's awesome. Uh, two, Gabriel Garcia Marquez is awesome. Uh, just a, a comment about uh, 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 100 Years of Solitude. Mm -hmm. I haven't read it. Several of my friends were like, what? You haven't read 100 Years of Solitude? I know, right? so, uh, so when I finally got to it, um, I stayed up 48 hours. I mean, coffee does great things. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really could not put it down. I, mean, mm -hmm. I could not go to sleep. It's like, no, I cannot, I cannot stop. Right. I, uh, I was a student. I didn't go to school those days. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> Did you read House of the Spirits? No. From my ending? Yes. How does it come? Have you read 100 Years of Solitude? How does it compare? Because they're both generational. I've not read House of the Spirits. Oh, you need to read House of the Spirits. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Whereas House of Spirits is okay. Well, they both have this, but <laughs> is, is is more made up. They're, right. They're, they're, they're much more of a society of things are um, invented and not. I can't. I, but your solitude is yeah. it's like you can you can see it. I can see why he read it for two days. It's just, it's just like way too much. I know, but and there's like whole diagrams. Yeah. I should write a paper. I should write a paper, like comparing and contrasting. No, no, I don't want. I don't know. Don't do that to me. <laughs> but thank you, thank you. Yes. Is better than death, constant beyond love. Your honest <laughs> opinion. Please ask that so everybody hears. Better pass the mic. Would you say this story is a lot better than death, constant beyond love, which is another one of his great books? Clearly, she was one of my past 1302 students. Um, okay, so Death, Constant Beyond Love is a short story where this is a novella. So the links are comparable. Um, there are some parallels. There's actually, remember when we talked about saltpeter? There's saltpeter in this book. Um, <clears throat> I would say Chronicle of a Death Foretold is better. Um, because it's just interesting, right? Death, more const death Constant Beyond Love is interesting, but I think uh, it's a little short. I, 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 I almost wish he would have expended it by like three pages. Yeah. Because there's enough there for that. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so I have more of a general question. Yeah. So usually when I read books, they're like informative or about like race, government, they usually steer away from like fiction. Like till today, I didn't know what magic, uh, magical realism was. Stick with me, kid. I'll teach you all you need I to know. I know one genre because I feel like I can understand it. And like fiction, I get lost with like plots and characters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like in the past Thursday, mm -hmm. the sociopath, I said that as literal. A literal sociopath, right? Yeah. Rather than a figurative sociopath. Yeah, so I don't know if that's because I've only conditioned myself to research books and I don't understand them. Mm -hmm. So for a person who used like six of those and mm -hmm. never really dive into fiction and my rules and all these other great genres of books, like, mm -hmm. how do you go about finding the genre that you can understand it and kind of like be open minded? Because I know sometimes if I've read five ways, I don't get it, I'll stop reading because I don't know what I'm reading. Good question. First, do your 1302 homework. Yeah, we have a lot of stories to read, so that's going to help a lot. Um, second, you know, books are great to read alone, but they're so much better when you are reading them with other people, when you are able to talk to someone about it, right? Like, we literally just like, did you read this book? Did you read this book? How are they different? Like, we had a, a low mini conversation, right? Um, how did you take this? How did you take that? Remember um, in class we did this thing and then we had we talked about it in group, right? It's a talking about it in group that helps you understand that that was, a, that was not literal, that was figurative, right? Helps you get out of that shell. What did I say? The best way to be a better reader is to read. The best way to be a better writer is to write and read. So practice, practice, practice. Read the book. <laughs> and then come see me and I will give you more books to read. Should be in our bookstore. It's in the bookstore. <laughs> Get it. Okay, it's also on Libby the app it, as an audio book. Oh. Any other questions? Comments? Concerns? I have a comment. You have a comment? You better. I ain't in your class one. <laughs> but I think that's really good to have another another person's perspective on something. I remember we were in class with you, and I thought it was it was so much fun just 
since being able to interact and give our different points of views. I've even changed my opinions with some things, you know, just from knowing that and hearing the other person's point of view. So I, I definitely agree. That's a great way to get an understanding. The whole purpose of literature, not the purpose, but one of the big purposes of literature is empathy. It's to try to understand other people that you're that you're not interacting with or don't know what their experiences are like, right? Stories can change the world. I I believe it. Whoever owns the story owns the world, essentially. I know you should probably write that down. It's a good quote. Um, and uh, stories change can change people, can change what they think, can change what they believe, or can make them consider something different. I believe in the power of the story and the power of the of the written word. Not a word here. So. Thank you. I do. Thank you for having me. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe for more content from LSC Kingwood.